Welcome to Aging on the Sun Coast. I'm your host, Jason Martino. Did you know that Alzheimer's disease is the sixth largest cause of death for Americans? Did you also know that 16.1 million Americans provide unpaid care for people with Alzheimer's disease or other dementias? The Alzheimer's Association Facts and Figures adds that every 65 seconds, someone in the United States will develop this disease. This is projected to grow to every 33 seconds by mid-century. Currently, 5.7 million Americans are living with the disease and those who are affected by the greatest proportion are women and minorities. These facts are startling. Today's show is near and dear to me. Like many of you, Alzheimer's disease touches my family. We've invited Katherine Cruikshank, the Director of Education with the Alzheimer's Association Florida Gulf Coast Chapter, to shed light on a growing issue. We're going to explore this disease with the goal to increase your understanding and also learn where to turn for help. Catherine, welcome to Aging on the Sun Coast. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you had a little drive this morning. You came, uh, you headed north all the way from Bonita Springs, and we appreciate you coming to our area to talk about um, Alzheimer's disease and some re um, related disorders. Well, it's my pleasure. Yeah. So why don't we uh, why don't we talk uh, broadly about what is what is Alzheimer's disease? Alzheimer's disease is just one form of dementia. It's the most popular form of dementia. It accounts for roughly 70% of the dementias out there. And dementia is a broad term. Most people think of it as just simply memory loss, but it can be changes in speech, behavior, perception. There can be 10 different combinations of symptoms that a person can have with dementia. And Alzheimer's is the most prevalent one. The most prevalent, huh? How does, uh, how does one differentiate between Alzheimer's disease and, and the other related disorders? At first sight, there isn't a lot of difference, so it's important to get a good diagnosis. But the earlier symptoms usually seen with Alzheimer's type dementia is memory loss, often changes in alertness and awareness, changes in speech, and mood changes. Yeah. So um, one of the things I, I want to key in on is the memory loss. That is, um, seems to be the biggest predictor of um, some of the symptoms out there. Um, and I'm going to use myself for an example. So mm -hmm. if, uh, if I had a loved one or I was experiencing uh, memory loss myself and I was conscious of that, what's, what's some of the first steps do you think that I should take um, to figure that out? Well, a lot of people with dementia will recognize that something's wrong with them. They may not know the degree that something is wrong. They may think it's just wrong a little bit, whereas friends and family may notice a more significant change in them. So both uh, for a person experiencing changes and for friends and family, it's always good to document the changes. What did they see? Maybe what time of day did they see it? Uh, because fatigue later in the day can play a role on people also. Uh, did diet change? Was there a change in medication? Is there another illness present? So it's very important to document what are the changes and why are they significant to that person. Mm. Yeah, that, that makes great sense. Mm -hmm. uh, you and I were talking about uh, food journals um, a little bit earlier, another mm -hmm. way to, to take a look at uh, memory loss and, and capture the different times in there. Uh, families come from all different backgrounds and dynamics and conversations uh, occur in, in different ways amongst all the different uh, individuals that we, that we know and we serve. Um, and some uh, conversations are sometimes taboo and a lot of families don't like to bring it up. Um, so if we were to um, um, suspect that uh, one of our loved ones had some memory issues, can you give us some tips on, on maybe how we can uh, entertain a conversation to take a look into that? It's really important to talk about it, and you're right, a lot of families hesitate to talk about it. There is a lot of stigma surrounding this illness. Uh, people are afraid uh, that losing their memories means they're losing their mind. There's a lot of uh, very antiquated stigmas attached to it, and so it is important to talk about it. It's important to address seeing changes in ourselves and seeing changes in our loved ones. So to mention that, gee, you seem to be a little forgetful lately, more than usual. Is something bothering you? Mm. Are you stressed? It's a nice, gentle way to engage the conversation. Uh, if the person is hesitant to talk about themselves, the person with dementia or suspected dementia, then maybe the family should discuss amongst themselves, has each member seen or noticed something different in their loved one? And per 
compare notes, not to gang up on the person, but just to get, uh, get a perspective on is something changing, has more than one person noticed it, and then approach the conversation and say, look, we've, we're concerned something's going on here. And it may not be Alzheimer's or dementia. It could be something else that can be corrected. Uh, mismedication, another illness that's being neglected or mismanaged, and getting that dealt with can help the person go back to normal. Well, it could be a vitamin deficiency. So it's important to address the issue and see if it is something that can be corrected. If it is a progressive dementia, it's important to get a good diagnosis on that as well. Yeah, so let's talk about that. And you raised some really great good points about reconciling that, and especially with uh, family members of all types. And, and um, that's the beautiful thing about people is that we come from all sorts of backgrounds and uh, we cover a lot of neat things. Um, diagnoses, um, the person that I understand that does most of the diagnoses is the neurologist. And um, um, so when someone is going to make a, uh, an appointment with that neurologist, what are some things that they could prepare for and or um, what could they expect during that visit? Always go with someone who knows you well. So the person experiencing memory issues or dementia type symptoms, because again, they may not all be memory issues. They can be changes in speech, changes in balance, changes in mood. Something's not right with that person go with a spouse or an adult child or a best friend, but someone who's going to be honest about the changes that have been seen. The person experiencing the symptoms may be forthcoming with the doctor, but not be aware of the degree of change they've experienced or exhibited. So the person that goes with them should be able to elaborate on what's been noticed. And also it's good to go with someone because of the issue that uh, perception and memory can be altered in the person. They may not remember clearly what the doctor said, but also we want the immediate family and support system of that person to know what are they dealing with. Unfortunately, a lot of parents have the approach with their adult kids of sugarcoating the reality of the situation. So we need to be really honest about this. Uh, this is an illness that is progressive. So we need to know the degree of which it's affecting a person and proceed that way. Yeah, all great points and, and very helpful information. We, we appreciate you um, expounding on that. Um, it always helps to prepare our residents when they're, they're um, uh, approach with a, uh, a crisis in, in some mm -hmm. senses and, um, and we can do it in a, a soothing or a candorous way. However, um, I think you, you offer good information for that. Let's talk about prevalence. Um, um, obviously, the Alzheimer's Association um, does a lot of uh, research and, and uh, maintains a lot of facts and figures. What does it look like in the state of Florida or, or locally in, in Pinellas and Pasco County for um, folks affected? Nationally, one in every 58.9 people of all ages has Alzheimer's disease. That statistic does not focus on other dementias. It focuses just on Alzheimer's. Bringing it down to Pasco County, it's one in 35 people of all ages. And in Pinellas, it's one in 30 people of all ages. That statistic does not include snowbirds. Yeah, we have a lot of them here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, treatments. Are, um, what kind of treatments are available for folks with, um, with Alzheimer's disease? Currently, there are a few medications that are approved specifically for Alzheimer's disease. Unfortunately, they have not been able to do what we hope they would do. They will help a person a little bit if they are diagnosed early in the progress of their illness and start the medication early they will only do a little for the person. They won't stop or reverse damage that's already done. Uh, these are progressive illnesses, so we're still looking for a first survivor. Uh, there is a lot of research that is going on, and hopefully we'll have a, a better treatment or a cure in the near years to come. Yeah, and that was gonna be my, my follow-up question to that, um, um, and I know that um, just through some history that a lot of the uh, the medications and um, and the what we'll call treatments for lack of better terms uh, really treat a lot of the symptoms um, more than the disease with, within itself does um there is there a cure at this moment in time no no 
Um, how about research? Do we have a lot of uh, good people working on some there's, um, things? There's a lot of promising research. Uh, the Alzheimer's Association is leading the way to raise awareness and advocacy for research and has pushed the argument forward, not just in this nation, but globally to find a cure. Uh, it is an illness that is being uh, researched around the globe. There are a lot of uh, trials going on in the United States. Uh, and if people are interested, we do have Trial Match, which is a free way for researchers to load their programs online. They are vetted. And then the public at large, healthy or affected with a dementia or suspected dementia, can go online and see what forms of research trials are available in their area by zip code or across the nation. And if they're not sure what they would be uh, good for, there are operators who can take their profile and make matches and suggest some research for them. It is not a hard sale. Uh, people won't chase you down. They will just offer suggestions and then people can follow up with the research in their area or across the nation. There what? are over 220 trials going on right now. What a great um, resource that you all are, are putting for people, and especially for individuals. It's not just in the scientific circle, but it's, it's available to people, mm -hmm. and, and that's helpful. Let's talk about your, your organization. Um, who and what is the Alzheimer's Association? The Alzheimer's Association was founded in the early 1980s. We are a not-for-profit organization. We are here to support and educate people and families dealing with Alzheimer's or related disorder. And uh, we are also very large on advocacy and pushing research forward. You sure are. And where are you located? We are in 17 counties in Florida. Mm -hmm. Well, we make up the Florida Gulf Coast chapter. Mm -hmm. There are three chapters in the state of Florida and roughly 82 chapters across the nation. Um, that, yeah, you have a lot of chapters across this. Uh, do you have a, a headquarters? Is that in Washington or is it? Our national office is in Chicago and our chapter office is here in the Clearwater area. Oh yeah, I think we're pretty lucky in this area for that too. And what a big swath of jurisdiction that you really cover for the Florida Gulf Coast chapter. I think I heard it was all the way up from, was it uh, Levy County and then down to Collier? Uh, Sumter, over to Polk, down to Collier. Yeah, and um, uh, the services that you, uh, that you offer individuals in the community, is there a cost to them? Is there an eligibility factor? All our services are free of charge. They're all confidential. Uh, we have uh, grants. We also have funders. And then we have our Walk to End Alzheimer's, which is our largest event of the year. And also coming up in June, which is Alzheimer's and Brain Awareness Month, we have the longest day. Yeah, yeah. So um, what types of individuals should be looking to contact the Alzheimer's Association to uh, investigate what you offer? Anyone who's curious about memory issues, uh, we are very pro-awareness. We want people to know what is normal aging, forgetfulness, and what could be a serious problem. So everyone should be looking up the 10 warning signs, knowing what is normal, what isn't normal, and being familiar with that, mm -hmm. just for their overall health and well-being, and for the overall health and well-being of their seniors and their family. Yeah. Um, uh, you provided great information for the first half of our, half of our show, and we're going to uh, hopefully have you back for the second half so we can even go a little further and, and talk about all the different types of programs that you offer there. Please stay with us while we take a short break. As usual, don't forget to have a pen or pencil ready. During the break and at the end of our show, we'll be running contact information for the Alzheimer's Association and the Aging and Disability Resource Center helplines. James is 70 and a writer whose joint pain has been a story in itself. His doctor prescribed a new medication that may not be affordable, even with James's Medicare Part D plan. James called Shine. Shine volunteer counselors can guide you to money-saving prescription assistance programs, including a program that helps pay Medicare Part D plan costs for limited income seniors. Shine costs nothing but could save you time and money. More information is available at 1-800-963-5337.
Welcome back to Aging on the Sun Coast. During the first half of the show, Catherine Cruikshank helped us understand a lot about Alzheimer's disease and about the Alzheimer's Association. So let's move this conversation forward and delve into some resources the Alzheimer's Association offers throughout Pinellas and Pasco counties. Catherine, welcome back to Aging on the Sun Coast. Hi. Hey, so we covered a lot of good information um, about Alzheimer's disease itself and then also about um, about your association. And uh, one, of the, one of the areas that I wanted to start with um, on the second half of the show was the helpline. And um, the, the Aging and Disability Resource Center through the Area Agency on Aging, we also have a helpline as well. And I have a good understanding of what that is. But give us our, our viewership um, a little perspective of what the helpline is through the Alzheimer's Association. Our helpline is a confidential 24-7 number that is manned by master's level clinicians prepared to answer questions, uh, help you problem solve. If you're upset in each event, they'll help walk you through that. And it is a free service, as all our services are free. And it is a wonderful way for people to reach out and ask one question or 100 questions uh, to find services in their area, to find out about programs in their area. And also, being local to the area, we know immediate resources, but it's also a national helpline. So if mom and dad live here in the Pinellas Pasco area, but the kids are in Nebraska or California, you can also be connected with the offices there and find out how the services, agencies, resources may be slightly different in that area and uh, support the family across the nation. Yeah, and I heard you say 24-7, so yes. that, that um, equates to me that you have somebody that's live. There's no voicemails and everything else. You get a real person uh, mm -hmm. any hour of the day, and they're all very familiar with dementia. They are trained in dementia, so you get a real person. You don't get a voicemail or an answering machine or a leave a message. Yeah, what a, what a great resource for people, and, um, and especially when they, they make that decision to actually call. It may not be during mm -hmm. normal working hours that they either have the time to call or that they um, make that final decision that that's something that they want to start to investigate. Mm -hmm. um, big county area, 17 counties uh, uh, throughout the, uh, the Florida Gulf Coast region. We're talking today about services in, in Pasco and Pinellas and programs. Let's talk a little bit about the programs that the Alzheimer's Association can um, offer. Let's can you tell us? We have a lot of education programs. Uh, many are geared for community awareness and education, and we have specialized caregiver training classes that talk about the basics of Alzheimer's and related dementias, how to get diagnosed, uh, having difficult conversations such as getting diagnosed, driving, legal issues. We have programs on behavioral issues and communication issues and later life care, uh, activities for people with dementia, virtually any subject matter you can think of we have a program on and we offer them throughout the counties. Uh, they are done at different intervals and so uh, we are here to educate caregivers and the community. What a neat resource over there. Mm -hmm. And education is key, is it not? Yes. We also have our new e-online learning because for many caregivers, they can't leave their job in the middle of the day to go to a program or they can't leave their loved one at home. They may not be able to get care in the home. So we have online learning as well for caregivers that they can do any hour of the day, two in the morning if that works for them. They're free and they can just visit alz.org and go to caregiver education to pull that up. You, uh, you make a great point. Uh, a lot of the folks that the Area Agency on Aging and obviously the Alzheimer's Association when they're or serving individuals, they're, they're homebound, or they just, um, um, for their own reason and or for the fact that they have to do round the clock care for these individuals. So that's mm -hmm. one great resource that they can offer where they can do it online and, and capture that way. Um, one of the buzzwords in, in our county for a variety of different instances is support groups. Do you offer support groups um, um, throughout our, our two county region? In the two counties, there are over a dozen support groups that are offered monthly, bi-weekly, and weekly. Uh, they are in different areas, so we always encourage people to find the groups that are nearest them, but also to try out different groups too, because each group has a different energy, different dynamic, so it's finding that, that 
comfortable niche. Uh, they are sa safe environments for people to vent and learn about the illness in. Support group is really for caregivers to ask questions and for their peers to answer those questions based on their experiences. They are uh, facilitated by a trained facilitator, but they're a great environment for caregivers to learn about the illness and to learn that they're not alone in their journey. We also have an online support group that we offer as well. Yeah, I was gonna ask you about that. Um, similar to your e-learning that you spoke about, is, um, is there a, an online mode where people at home can also connect with other people to talk about their other caregivers? For yes, it's, yeah. it's uh, very similar to a 24-7 chat room. It also is monitored by a facilitator too, mm -hmm. so that if there's any uh, miscommunication or uh, misinformation that is there, that can get clarified. What a great resource. Yeah, I'm real excited to hear that uh, you guys offer that as well. Um, um, we're still coming a long way in the 21st century to, to meet people's um, needs. Yes. So there's there's so much information and there is a, um, a bounty of resources for caregivers themselves. Um, what about the person that actually is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease or related disorder? What's, what's available for that person? We have a host of early stage programs and they are designed for the person with a diagnosis of Alzheimer's or related dementia. And some are early stage engagement programs, which are social programs. They can involve music therapy or art therapy, but there's also an educational component entwined about the illness. And it's wonderful because it's peer-to-peer -peer support. You meet other people who are dealing with a similar diagnosis. And again, it lets people know that they're not alone in this illness. We have early stage support groups for people which are geared just for the person with a diagnosis. We have a specialized class program called Living with Alzheimer's, which is a three-week program, two hours each week. And that, again, is a peer-to-peer -peer program. So it, we, we offer several. We also have the Memory Cafe. Yeah, I was going to say, because you and I were talking about these Memory Cafe. What a, yeah. what a cool idea. Yeah, the Memory Cafe is a social engagement program where the person with a diagnosis and their care partner can go together and it is social. It's encouraged when you're there that the people with a diagnosis mix and mingle amongst themselves and caregivers mix and mingle amongst themselves. So there's a wonderful support group aspect to it. Uh, it's very social, it's very low key, and often there is a brief element of education, 20 to 30 minutes, um, a nurse or a doctor may come in to answer questions, an elder law attorney may come in to do a brief talk about uh, legal papers and so on. But it's, it's a social program and it, uh, they're usually offered uh, bi-weekly or once a month in various areas and uh, they run about 60 to 120 minutes. Oh, okay. That's, um, that's a good amount of time to really uh, meet and mingle and, and to share. Um, are, do they come out of uh, Alzheimer's Association facilities or are those through partnerships that you all may have? They are with partnerships uh, with different sponsors, different agencies, and they're typically hosted at a neutral site, um, literally at a cafe. Some are at uh, halls, some are at uh, church locations, uh, non-denominational uh, groups, but where there are different areas where people can be comfortable, large enough to mix and mingle, but not be interrupted by other people. Yeah, so if the, uh, if the uh, public and or organizations are listening and watching our show today, there's always an opportunity to assist the Alzheimer's Association with maybe sponsoring a site where our more additional memory cafes can be around. That'd be wonderful, yeah. yes. Um, care consultation. I've heard this term a couple different times. I'm not quite sure I think I, I fully know what it is. Can you, can you elaborate a little bit on what care consultation is? Care consultations are a great service. In fact, they're one of my favorite services because it's where um, you can meet with a person over the phone or face-to-face, -face, um, either a caregiver or someone who's not quite sure about their family situation will call and uh, we will either talk to them immediately over the phone or set an appointment depending on what works for them uh, and talk about their immediate situation, uh, educate them on what they need to do if they haven't quite gotten diagnosed yet, uh, explain to them that process and what to expect. Um, we will talk about family dynamics. We will talk about uh, what to expect at various stages of the illness. Uh, 
will talk about who in their family has what strengths and how they can contribute. Because not everybody's a good caregiver, hands-on for day-to-day -day challenges. Some may be, some adult children may be better at the legal or financial part of things and can contribute that way. So it's knowing everybody's strengths and weaknesses. A care consultation is a great conversation to work out what to expect and what to do in the future. And it may not be an isolated care consultation, it can be many, depending on the person and their needs. Um, and again, they can be face-to-face -face on the phone. I've done some where I've had family members, both the care spouse and adult children sitting in front of me, and one or two other children on speakerphone in another country, or they couldn't quite leave the office, but they wanted to participate. Yeah. So we, we try to get the whole family on the same page. Yeah, it sounds yeah. like it. And um, some of the things that I, that I, when I was listening to you talk about, it sounded like multiple people were involved. Does that mean that there's a team approach to this? There can be. Mm -hmm. Some families are very supportive of each other. Some families are a bit more challenged. So a care consult doesn't have to involve the entire family, but whoever is trying to be involved, and we try to educate them on their means. A care team it can be a broad uh, term, which will encompass a variety of people, the main caregiver, uh, often a spouse, maybe some of the adult children. It can also involve uh, maybe a parish nurse, the doctors who are treating the person, uh, maybe some good friends who will help take that person out and support them in their regular activities as they progress. So a care team can be a combination of people. Yeah, I, and um, so it, it takes a community sometimes. It huh? does. Yeah, so um, um, I'm going to go back to that walk. Um, I participated in the Alzheimer's Association walk. Um, I'm a contributor for the fundraising on there. I believe in it. Thank and you. And it's such a big process and, and such a big event that's attended by thousands and, and thousands of people. And I know largely by volunteers. Um, does the Alzheimer's Association utilize volunteerism to achieve some of the goals they'd like to accomplish? We love volunteers uh, it, and we utilize them in many ways. One, to get the message out there. Uh, to raise awareness in the community, uh, letting people know that our services are here for them. That's what we exist to do, help them through the journey of dementia. Uh, with the walk, we're always looking for people to be team captains, be on our planning committee, uh, be on our organizational forums, and so to have community volunteers is a, a great aspect. That's great, um, Catherine. Catherine, we really appreciate you taking that drive, coming up here today. Talk about all the cool things that you are doing in our area, and, uh, and we hope to have you back soon. My pleasure, anytime. Yeah. Uh -huh. We hope you enjoyed this month's broadcast. We also hope the, this episode encouraged you to seek assistance through the Alzheimer's Association Helpline. Together, as partner agencies, we hope to complement your journey with the information and options. We'll see you next month. Until then, we hope you maximize every opportunity available to you. James is 70 and a writer whose joint pain has been a story in itself. His doctor prescribed a new medication that may not be affordable, even with James's Medicare Part D plan. James called Shine. Shine volunteer counselors can guide you to money-saving prescription assistance programs, including a program that helps pay Medicare Part D plan costs for limited income seniors. Shine costs nothing but could save you time and money. More information is available at 1-800-963-5337.